Hi, everybody. Welcome to GW Center for Integrative Medicine Zoomcast. I'm your co-host, Dr. Kogan, Medical Director of Center for Integrative Medicine and Associate Professor of Medicine at GW and Associate Director of Geriatric Fellowship. So today, an interesting topic. Those of you who've been following uh, development in, in the field of anti-aging or healthy aging and longevity, of course, have been hearing about this molecule called urolithin A. Um, and um, a lot of celebrities and a lot of um, well-known anti-aging docs, such as Mark Hyman, have been quite strongly advocating for this. So I decided to kind of go into a little bit of a detail here and um, try to present my opinion, but also try to analyze some of the data. Uh, of course, if you like uh, this particular video and um, others, please do subscribe to this channel. It helps, um, it helps you to get up to date on um, whenever the new video comes up so you don't have to, um, you, you can see them right away. So what I decided to do is just in addition to talk a little bit about what the molecule is um, and what is the promise here, I'm gonna show you two studies. Um, uh, one, it's kind of a more what's called a scoping review or a systematic analysis of different studies that were conducted very recently, just a couple of months ago. And then I'm going to show you a JAMA article uh, from 2022 that's probably currently the best uh, randomized control trial we have uh, showing a benefit of this particular molecule. So what is uro urolithin A? Uh, so urolithin A is a metabolite. So it's the molecule that's produced by our microbiome, by our bacteria in the gut, um, when it digests a polyphenol compounds called elagitamin and also elagic acid. So those molecules are known to be, uh, you can think of them as a color molecule. Sometimes we would just call them tannins that are present in certain foods. Uh, definitely berries like strawberries, raspberries have, um, but there are actually quite a lot of foods that contain them. Uh, what I'll do is I'll make sure that I put kind of a quick list of foods and also all the links if you care about looking into it. So, but for this conversion from elagic acid specifically to the urolithin A, you have to have a pretty well functioning microbiome. Uh, it's not very well understood how that conversion occurs from uh, individual to individual. So we know it happening, it's happening, but what we don't know is how do you predict whether one person will have good conversion, not good conversion, so even if you eat a lot of the good foods to give you a good amount of elagic acid, will you get enough urolithin A? And the data on that is actually missing. There's not a lot of clarity um, and there's no real easy way in the clinical settings to assess it. So I think that's what new, um, per basically promoted uh, an attempt to start looking into why can't we just give people urolithin A, which it, it is available, it's, it can be purchased, there are multiple companies making it. I'm going to stay away from the conversation where to get it, how to buy it, well, for two reasons. So one, um, you know, I, I need to stay completely independent of all the different um, um, products out there. Uh, and two, it's actually not very clear as to, um, at least until FDA regulates this, which never going to happen probably, um, it's not very clear um, exactly will you be able to obtain the products that are uh, studied specifically. So you can obtain some exact dose of urolithin A, but if that's not the actual studied brand, uh, will you actually be getting it? So I'm gonna stay out of that conversation, but if you're interested, you can of course contact us and we can discuss um, you know, either in a clinic or in some other settings, how you can do that or how I recommend for people to do that in the clinical practice. So, well, let's do, uh, go right in into more details. So first I'm gonna uh, show you this study and this is titled, um, the urolithin A as a potential agent for prevention of age-related diseases, a scoping review. This is, uh, first was uh, received for publication in January 23 and published in uh, July of uh, this year of 2023. Um, so you have, um, 
very typical process where the researchers have looked at 293 articles, they screened them all down and they analyzed only 15 articles that as of July 2023 were able to pass their scrutiny into a quality studies. Uh, and I'm going to skip a lot of this because I don't think it's really relevant. You can always look up how they actually did the analysis and how they screened the studies in and out. But the meat of the study is right here in this table. And again, of course, you're going to get a link to this study. And there are in uh, open access. You don't need any passwords. So most of the studies are actually like this first one, two, and three. These are all what we would be calling an in vitro study or a study on the um, uh, petri dishes. So they're just analyzing function on in the on the, in the bench research. It's not actually clinical or preclinical study, what we call in animal models. But then there are several human studies, and this is where things get really important. So the study five and six, study by Andrews in 2019 and then by Lou in 2022. This is the one we're going to analyze in a minute looked at a small number of patients. So 60 patients in 2019 and 66 in 2022. And this is where we're going to discuss. So the first study, this one, looked at basically just bioavailability and also mitochondrial biomarkers. And then as a follow-up to that study, this one actually looked into some functional parameters. This is what's really important. Um, there were more studies here. You can see there's a lot more here. But I don't think a lot of this, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to discuss them. They're very important in their ways. Um, but they're not really telling us um, how to necessarily put this in a clinical practice. So let's go to the JAMA article. So this is titled, Effect of Urolithin A Supplementation on Muscle Endurance and Mitochondrial Health in Older Adults. So this was an academic study. So this was conducted in one of the US universities. Uh, between 2018 and 2020, so they did manage to get this through the COVID, um, so it's pretty impressive that they were able to finish up. Um, so they took 66 patients, they randomized them into groups. So one group uh, took a placebo, and then one group took urolithin A, um, and the, they were packaged in 250 milligram capsules and patients took four capsules in the morning on empty stomach. Um, and then they measured a couple of things. So I'm not gonna discuss what the significance of this molecule is. Uh, in short, it's a, one of the marker of uh, oxidative stress, uh, but C-reactive protein is very clinically relevant. It's something that can be really easily assessed. So they analyzed that. And then they analyzed something really important. So this is what's called a six minute walk distance. That's a functional assessment in geriatrics, which we actually, we don't really do this in the clinical practice. It's not so easy to do because you know you have to have wide space and assess the exact distance in six minutes. So this is, it's not easily done, but it's a very well uh, established uh, parameter for study of, of functionality of a muscles. Interestingly, they did a couple of their analysis here. They specifically looked at um, um, some, um, biomarkers of mitochondria, which again, this was done before, but they did this again in this trial. So let's drop right into the results. Um, I'm gonna skip a lot of this, just, uh, but you can review this on your own time. Uh, so the demographics were, uh, this were primarily women. Um, most of the patients were women at about 70% or even 80% here in this group. They were in the early 70s on average. Um, of course, as you can see, there were white so that does present, present a significant problem here for other um for other uh, races so that's a problem but, but that's a very typical research problem that unfortunately minorities are often underrepresented in the studies um so and then what they did is they looked at the side effects so the side effects profile was very very similar there's not really much to discuss so it seems pretty safe now, this is where the results are. Now, this is what's called the dot plots. Um, I'm not going to really discuss in detail sort of how does this get generated. But basically, what you're comparing, there's this line and this line, and you're comparing them. So both groups improved. Placebo improved by about 40 meters, and then the um, urolithin A improved by 60 meters uh, in four months. So they were able to walk a little further 
after six months. And you should ask, well, what does that mean? Well, it's not actually statistically significant. So the result was very, very minimal in terms of clinical applicability here. But there, were, I'm going to go back and kind of go to the summary because it's a little easier to understand here. But, you know, actually, there were a few things that were important. So the C-reactive protein decreased more so in urolithin, and that was statistically significant. Um, and probably even more important that there was a significantly larger change in production of um, energy in, in the mitochondria at ATP levels in the urethin A. And again, that was also statistically significant, except what was not statistically significant, again, is this difference of basically roughly 20 meters um, in the uh, urolithin A versus placebo. So, you know, it, it's kind of hard to put this all in perspective in terms of significance. Um, the last thing I'll say, which is probably the most um, relevant to the clinical practice, and that's what something called con, um, endurance of the muscles. And the way they did this, they basically measured repetition of particular task. And here the difference was quite cl clinically big. So you can see that in at two months, um, uh, the, the patients who would, uh, the subjects who were taking urolithin A were able to contract the muscles a lot more. And that difference was very large. So see here it, it was uh, 95 uh, versus 41 contractility. So that's a doubling of capacity for the muscles to repeat its function. So that's probably the most clinically significant item. Unfortunately, can you sort of how do you transfer that to something quite measurable in uh, um, so, so, something like a six minute walk or the muscle strength, et cetera? Well, that, that's that would be a next step um, because part of the things or part of the difficulties with trials like this is very simple. When you're analyzing um, functional parameters, uh, you're going to expect some changes. The problem is that in order to for changes to be significant, large, and clinically really relevant, you generally have to have much, either much larger numbers, which of course this trial is going to cost a lot more, um, and more importantly, it, it, you're probably going to need to do this a lot longer. So they only did this for four months. Again, I'm sure it's all budget based. Um, so. So how do I put this all together? Definitely urolithin A has a very major potential as one of the upcoming synolytics. Uh, so synolytics mean slowing down or reversing aging, um, particularly in the uh, functional status of muscular strength, which those of you who've been following me for a while know that that's the most important thing that I often discuss in, in, in sense of longevity. So it's actually not necessarily what you eat. It's not necessarily certain things uh, in your social network and others, but actually the, the, the functionality and the muscle strength seems to be probably number one. So it's kind of most important that, that will predict your longevity uh, in an absence of a freak accident or acute severe illness, of course. We don't count those. So, uh, so what does all this mean? Before I actually kind of try to translate all this to clinical practice and tell you my opinion on all this, um, the study was sponsored by uh, a European company, um, and um, I guess it doesn't really matter what the name is, but um, I will say it because I think it's actually somewhat important, so you're fully aware. That's a Swiss uh, biotech company called Amazentis. Um, they have provided not just the, the product and placebo, but they also were involved in the implementation and design of the trial. Um, that always should question quality of outcomes, uh, but the study was published in JAMA, so the leading journal of American Medical Association. It did pass all the required institutional review board. It passed all the scrutiny of the Peer review process. And so clearly this was well designed, implemented, uh, regardless what you think about uh, the um, product uh, manufacturer in influence on the trial. Um, but I, I thought I would disclose that. So, uh, so the, the patients took a thousand milligram a day. Uh, this, there has been some studies showing that taking less than 500 milligrams does pretty much nothing. 
I think that's why they picked a thousand, I'm guessing. And uh, clinically, there are a number of products on the market. You can definitely obtain thousand milligrams. I would say that don't take less than 500 if you're gonna decide to try it. Uh, will you try 500 or a thousand will depend on a few things. So it will depend on how much money you're ready to pay. It's not a cheap product. Uh, some of the products out there at, at this dosing will set you back probably close to hundred dollars a month. So not cheap at all. Uh, clearly we don't have any sense of longitudinal effect here, right? We don't know if this would be done for a year, whether the results will be better, worse, or the same. So that's another important aspect. You know, you need to do longer studies because clearly if somebody were to take this product, they'll probably need to take it for a long time, if not for the rest of your life. Now, you should also ask the following question. Well, what if somehow the people who got into this study had some problems with their gut? The, the researchers didn't screen it. Researchers didn't assess, uh, and they didn't ask any questions about their stomach. They didn't ask any questions about how much fermented food they eat, or what is the status of their gastrointestinal, like do they have any GI illnesses, for example. So what does that mean? Well, we don't know. If, if, if what I said earlier, the fact that urolithin A is manufactured by our gut microbiome, and if you eat a lot of good foods that contain elagic acid, that then can get converted to urolithin A, well, would you be different from the people in this trial? There is no answer to that either. So, um, so is, it, is there a justification to start taking this? Well, I, I think it's really um, up to you uh, because it's clearly safe. It is metabolite of our own biology. So I don't expect much of the side effects from it. Um, the data is weak, in my opinion, but it's definitely better than for a lot of other things people take for anti-aging or for longevity. It's definitely better than, let's say, metformin. Um, and metformin data has been around for a while. And finally, I've been saying this for years, that metformin, in my opinion, only should be taken by patients who have reason medically to take it, meaning they have diabetes or pre-diabetic state, but definitely not by anybody healthy because it's a, you know, can negatively impact mitochondria and block absorption of number of nutrients. But, you know, so here's, you have a molecule, which is a lot safer now. Yeah, sure. It's much more expensive than a generic metformin, but nonetheless. So, you know, if you have a lot of money to spend on your health, why not? Um, but should you instead be optimizing your microbiome and eating a lot of foods high in oligic acid? Okay, so that would be up to you to decide. That's definitely the route I take. And I will be looking very carefully for myself whether or not I will be start adding this to my regimen of nutrients as I kind of look at the uh, consensual data. But I will start recommending it to some of the patients. I will definitely start recommending to patients who, in my opinion, have long-term GI problems, and I'm afraid that their capacity to uh, make their own um, um, uh, their own urolithin A will be limited for whatever reason. So those would be good patients for me to recommend it to. And also anybody who is really feeling like their muscles have been rapidly deteriorating for whatever reason, if you want to try to add that on, I don't see any reason not to. So hopefully this was helpful. Um, I'm gonna put all the links in. Uh, I will also put the link to uh, Wikipedia page. I, I find it kind of useful because it has a, a detailed date numbers for the elagic acid in specific foods. Um, and stay, stay tuned. I'll see you back um, covering all things integrative medicine, healthy, healthy aging, longevity. Stay, stay well, friends, stay warm. It's cold, cold days here on the East Coast nowadays. And I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.